science was beginning to emerge at the beginning of the 1800s, out of the 1700s, a lot of um, scientific study, biology, chemistry, physics, um, the age of enlightenment in the late 1700s. Now this is bringing science to the forefront and people are more interested in learning about how the world works. Um, we think about the philosophers of the time. There was Adam Smith, there was our own Thomas Jefferson talking about liberty and equality and individual rights. This is the age of people wanting to know more about their place in the world. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a French philosopher and he had some ideas about liberty and equality and those were the underpinnings of the French Revolution. However, he was quite specific that these ideas of liberty and equality did not include women. Women should be no more like men in mind than they are in body. The purpose of a woman is to take care of us when we're young, take care of us when we're old, and to make our lives agreeable in between. That's what she should be trained for. That's what she should be doing. And she really has no need to have any aspirations greater than that. Mary Wollstonecraft, an English writer, took exception to that. And I'm not going to quote her verbatim because it's very long, flowery, uh, extra words when you don't really need them. But she said, in essence, uh, as long as you treat us like we haven't got an equal ability of our mind, and as long as you keep educating us as if we don't have equal ability of our mind, then that's what's going to happen. We have just as much right to be educated and to find our own way in the world. That was her point. We'll get the ideas and we'll decide what's best for us and what direction we want to go in. That was the late 1700s, and as I said, science is beginning to, to come to the top. There are lectures, there are salons. Women are starting to attend them. How are they gonna get a foothold into science? Let's look at uh, a little bit of women's history. Up until the 1700s, the basic layout for women was uh, that because they weren't like men, they indeed didn't need to be educated, and if they did get an education, it was liable to, it was liable to make them ill. Women's minds should not be inflamed with ideas or concepts that will inflame their passions and that's going to be detrimental to their health. And so, I mean, if you've been told things enough, you start to believe them, and so that's what it was like until the 1700s, and then when this, when this idea of individual rights, there were women who said, I'd like to be part of that. Audubon himself hired women in the natural sciences. All these prints came off the press, so to speak, in black and white. And hundreds of women were, were hired to do the coloring. And whether or not they just did the coloring or whether they got to think about, wow, how does this work in nature? And I'd like to learn more about it. Mary Anning in England at the time was starting to discover fossils and recording and, and making drawings of, uh, of fossils from from prehistory, and Mary, Maria Sibylla Merriam, a German woman, decided that she would observe uh, moths coming out of cabbages. Now, it used, they used to think that the moths just sort of burst out of cabbages, that somehow the cabbage gave birth to the moth. But she discovered the process of metamorphosis, the process of caterpillar to, to, uh, to moth. And um, so few women were making inroads. Into the 19th century, the 1800s now, you've got uh, individual rights coming to the forefront. Slavery in this country was getting a second look, and a lot of abolitionist activities, and the women's rights movement went along with that idea that we should have freedom and equality in our society. After the Civil War, a number of colleges were, were um, started just specifically to educate women. Wellesley and Radcliffe and Smith and Vassar all set up to educate women and many brilliant scientific women have come out of those, those institutions. And then as the 20th century dawns now, women have pretty much agitated. They're going to get the right to vote in 1920. The doors are opening in education. 
And for those who may have gone through the 1960s, we know that there was another round of, of uh, asserting ourselves as women. It's, it's unfortunate that we have to think of women's history or black history as separate histories, but they weren't always included. There are some remarkable women who, uh, who started on the path of allowing women to become into natural sciences. This outfit that I'm wearing was designed by one of the women we'll talk about today. You see, I can be very proper in my skirt. And you don't think anything untoward of my behavior, but if I need to get on a horse or climb a mountain, see, I can do so. <laughs> and I won't put you through all the buttoning process <laughs> because getting dressed in this is a, is an activity unto itself. Yes. Get your exercise. But another woman that we'll talk about today is very happy to have this comfortable piece of clothing to wear when riding a horse. But the second she got off the horse, she would go in between the animals and put it back over so she was wearing a skirt. She did not want to show up in polite society, which I guess was the rest of the time she spent in the woods without having uh, her proper her proper skirt. So right there, clothing reform, dress reform was a big part of women making the inroads into being able to uh, participate in the way they wanted to. So I have some uh, pictures of women in bloomers. Martha Maxwell. Martha Maxwell was born in 1831 in Pennsylvania. Her grandmother raised her. Her grandmother took her for walks in the woods and she showed her about the natural world. Martha just loved learning about that. And when she was of age, now her stepfather believed in education for women at a time when this was not really considered proper. She went to Oberlin College for a couple of years and she was able to get education in art and philosophy. She just loved it. But as was often the case, the money ran out and she had to go home and help support her family. She did so by going home and teaching, and she didn't really like teaching that much, but she was able to, uh, to help her family get by. And then she married a man named Mr. Maxwell. Mr. Maxwell was a widower, many years older than her, had six children. Here's this young 22-year-old girl, really, but a couple of years into their marriage, gold was discovered in the Rocky Mountains. And he, Mr. Maxwell wanted to go west and get part of the gold that was in those mountains for himself. Nobody expected to stay. They're just going to go west, get their gold, and come home. She wanted to go along on the, on the um, expedition. She loved it. People hated crossing the prairies. It's nothing but flat open ground with prairie dog towns and and herds of buffalo, but she was, she was captivated by the prairie dog towns. There's the prairie dogs, and there's rattlesnakes, and there's burrowing owls sitting by the holes of those, ra of those uh, uh, prairie dogs. And those three creatures had a symbiotic relationship that she was fascinated with. No one else really cared that much about it. When she got to the gold camp, she, uh, she opened a boarding house, which was a uh, very popular and, uh, and uh, way to make money, and she hated it because she wasn't outside. But she started to understand a little bit more about the natural world, and taxidermy was introduced to her. And in 1868, after some other parts of her life came and went, she, she started collecting and mounting the species of the Rocky Mountains. She wanted to get every species that was in the Rocky Mountains, plants and birds. And, um, Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Maxwell, look here. Up in the tree, there's a, there's a hawk's nest. And I believe there are, are chicks in the I want I want that for the collection. Now, uh, you go over and see if you can climb up and get them. You can't quite reach well. Well, let me stand on your shoulders then. I can't quite reach. Um, stiffen your neck. I'll stand on your head. Oh. <laughs> oh, 
It's an egg and a chick. Come with me. Their mother isn't very happy about it. Oh, such precious cargo. Oh my, it is from the young that we can learn so much about a species now. The adult animals, well, they are in evidence everywhere and can be observed with the young. Well, that is where we can begin to really understand. Now, when we got back to the ranch there, I gave the egg to the hen house, where they had the dubious honor of hatching one of their most mortal enemies. And uh, the chick I didn't give to them, thinking that by its voice, they might think it wasn't one of theirs and kill it. And then when the other one was hatched, now, I had the two of them. And uh, I watched them, I I fed them as best I could, and, and I made a lot of careful notes, and then when each was clothed in a robe of downy feathers, a little chloroform induced them to stop growing, and I had my grouping. Two chicks, their beaks upstretched from the nest, and their mother hovering over them with a rabbit in her talons. Well, I... I know what you must be thinking. (laughs) A woman in the sciences, yes, I, I know that's unseemly. Botany, now there's a science for a woman. And do you know why? Well, just how indelicate can the reproductive habits of plants be? And that's what it comes down to. In, in nature, there is there's, uh, mating and birth and death and family life and all sorts of things that when you think about it, a woman is involved in in her own life. But to study about it, to learn about it, oh, I, I know the women like to go out and collect the plants and come into the parlor and have tea and discuss their findings. But I literally had to go outside of that. Now, one time someone gave me a turkey buzzard in some advanced state of decay, I must admit, but I didn't have one for the collection. So I took it outside into the creek and I worked on cleaning it up. My family begged me to abandon the project, uh, but I didn't. I didn't and there I had it. I restored that turkey buzzard, the great scavenger of the skies. But How many of those ladies in the parlor would have invited me over for tea after an afternoon in the creek with the turkey buzzard? Well, I wish you could see my workroom there. Everything and anything in some state of transformation. Uh, Owls, little tiny songbirds looking down over jumping mice or grizzly bears. And, well, You might wonder how I had the heart to kill so many animals. People think of that right off the bat. Well, people kill every day in order to eat. I have never taken a life for a carnivorous purpose. Everything dies sometime. And I merely shorten the period of consciousness in order to learn, in order to preserve. And so I leave it to you, which is better? To kill to eat, or to kill to immortalize. So, I can't do a program on natural history without talking about Rachel Carson, one of my heroes. She wouldn't really necessarily call her a naturalist per se. She was a biologist and an author. She was born in 1907. She was raised by a mother who took her out on walks in the natural world, and and she looked at things, and uh, she was always very curious, though, about the way the natural world was put together. And her mother said to her one time, Rachel, the Bible tells us that God created the world. (sighs) Rachel said, yes, mother, and General Motors created our Oldsmobile. But how is the question? That's what she wanted to know, how did this all work? She went to college to be a writer. She was an English major. But when she was a sophomore, she had to take a science requirement. She took biology. And of course, the rest is history. She just loved science. 
But it was the 1920s, and what woman in her right mind is going to major in science? But she did anyway, got her degree, and then went to work for Woods Hole Marine Bio Biology Institution, and oh, she saw the sea for the first time. She loved the sea. She'd always loved reading about it and hearing about it, but she'd never seen it. So here she was finally. One day her, her supervisor came in and said, would you write an article for our newsletter for all the lay people, just something. And when she wrote it and handed it to him and he read it, he gave it back to her and he said, I'm not putting this in the newsletter. I want you to send this to Atlantic Monthly. And they published it and from then on her writing career was born. A couple of years later, she wrote a book called The Edge of the Sea, which was received, she said, with sublime indifference. <laughs> Ten years later, her second book, The Sea Around Us, was published. And it was a critical uh, and popular success. It was bringing the idea of science to the general public. And she always was, she said, I'm always surprised at that. People wonder how a book about science could be so popular with everyone. Why do people think that science is a topic that should just be in a laboratory with a few people that have coats on? Mm -hmm. Science is all around us, she said. But you write with such poetic language and, and such lyric, um, lyric sensitivity about science. And she said, look, the, the goal of literature, the goal of science, is to report truthfully about what's there. If there's poetry in my writing, I didn't put it there. It's already there, and I reported truthfully about it. After World War II, she'd been looking at some of the, some of the toxic uh, poisons that had been used during the war. During the wartime and for emergency Elimination of insects, DDT was one of them. And after the war, it, they started to use it in a blanket way in agriculture. And if it's so good at killing things, let's put it in household cleaners. Let's put it in lotions so people can not have germs on them. And it was being used without a whole lot of oversight. She was doing some experiments with it and, and starting to understand it a bit. But then she got a letter from a friend of hers. She said, every year I go to the Outer Banks, and every year I notice there's fewer and fewer birds. And there's a chemical plant right there, and the water coming out of it isn't too good looking, and I wonder if you could see if there's a connection in some way between the loss of the birds and those chemicals. So she started looking into it. She wrote an article, but nobody wanted to publish it. <laughs> Houghton Mifflin, the, her, her uh, publisher, said, write a book. She said, okay, I'll give it seven months. She herself was not well at the time. I'll give it seven months. And two and a half years later, in 1962, Silent Spring was published. Silent Spring was published, and it asks one question. She said it just asks one fundamental question. Is it possible to lay down a barrage of chemicals on the earth without making the earth unfit for all life? No one had ever sort of put two and two together. In Michigan, in Michigan they were treating elm trees with five pounds of DDT per tree. This is five pounds, it's not DDT. But this is what five pounds looks like. Five pounds per tree. There's no way for it to break down. The leaves were falling to the ground and, and uh, being covered over with winter snow, decomposing, and the earthworms were eating the leaf and uh, becoming filled with DDT. And the robins would come back in the spring. And the robins were eating the worms, and 11 worms with DDT in them can kill a robin. And a robin can eat that many worms in that many minutes. So the robins that weren't dying were laying eggs that weren't hatching. There was this, this connection in, in, in the world that people had not really made a serious study of, and she did. And some took a dim view of that, imagine. 
chemical industry said that Rachel Carson doesn't write as a scientist, but as a fanatic defender of the cult of the balance of nature, her books are more poisonous than the pesticides she condemns. Time magazine said many scientists sympathize with Miss Carson's love of wildlife and even her mystical attachment to the balance of nature. But they fear that her emotional and inaccurate outburst in Silent Spring may do more harm by alarming the non-technical public. And Crop Life, the business newspaper of the farm chemical industry, said if man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Rachel Carson, we would return to the dark ages, and insects and disease and vermin would once again inherit the earth. Rachel Carson stood firm for what she said in her book. She died two years later in 1964 from cancer. She didn't have a chance to see that what she did started an entire movement, started a movement that puts us in a position to be accountable for what we're doing to the earth. If nothing else, improve our awareness of our connection. As John Muir said, when you tug on one thing in nature, you find it is connected to everything else. And uh, that's basically what she, she found out and what she wants us to remember. Does anybody have any questions about the program so far? We have a few <laughs> minutes left. I wanted to, to uh, shift gears a little bit and, and get into some of the uh, natural history stories that the Native people have. We have all kinds of scientific proofs and stories about what is so in the natural world, and they had a different perspective. Um, so I will, well, I've got my little porcupine here. This is a little porcupine kid. Martha Maxwell wrote in her book um, about someone giving her a porcupine kit when she was uh, living in Colorado, and she said it was the most sensitive little creature in the world. If you scold it for any reason, it will curl up in a ball, and it won't uncurl itself until you pick it up carefully and tell it that it's forgiven. From the natural world, turtle, turtle. Every turtle, land or sea or river or wherever it lives, has 13 sections on the back of its back. In fact, if you go into a museum that has prehistoric tortoise shells, turtle shells, they all have 13 plates. And the native people said that's the 13 moons on the back of a, of a turtle's shell, um, 13 full moons in a year. Now, we name our months after Roman gods, which doesn't have a huge connection to the natural world, but they named their months things that correlated to what was happening. The moon of strawberries blooming. The moon of falling leaves. The moon of popping trees. Do you know what, what time of year that is? January, February. Because? The freeze, you mean? Moon of popping trees. Buds? Well, that's what I thought. A lot of people think spring, that, that the buds are popping. But the trees actually pop in the winter when the sap freezes. It's watery. It's water, it freezes, it expands, and the wood expands, and that pops the tree. So the moon of popping trees is the winter. Um, and they have some marvelous stories about the interactions between animals in the natural world. This is, does everyone know what this is? It's what brought so many people to the West, beaver. There's a Seneca Indian story about a, an interrelationship between the turtle and the, the beaver. Turtle had a very lovely pond that it lived in very happy with his little pond, and in the winter time when it's cold, the beaver has to, or I'm sorry, the turtle has to get through the winter without freezing, so he goes to the bottom of the pond, digs in the mud, buries himself, and hibernates. Well, this one spring, turtle woke up, started swimming towards the top of the pool, and thought, why, this, this seems very uh, much larger. Didn't seem like it took me so long. 
to get to the top of the water in the past. And when he got up to the top of the water, he looked around his, his beautiful bank with the alder trees for sunning himself. The trees were gone and the bank was covered with water. And all around him, it seemed like this pond was so much larger. And then he heard a whap, a whap right on the surface of the water. And he looked over and here comes this strange creature swimming towards him, whap. And he heard that again and he said, who are you and what are you doing in my pond? And the creature said, I am beaver and this is my pond now. I just built a dam. I have got this pond all set for myself. Turtle said, I'm sorry, this is my pond. You have to leave. Well, then we'll fight over it, Turtle said. We'll fight over it and I'll get you. Beaver said, fine. I'll bring all my relatives. We'll come over and we'll fight you. And Turtle looked at the beaver and those big teeth in the front and he said um, to himself, I don't know that I could win that fight. So he said, well, I think that would be too easy for me to, to beat you, so I'm going to suggest a race, um, a contest, another contest of some kind first, and who can hold their breath longer? <clears throat> so beaver said, oh, no problem, I can go down, I can hold my breath all day underwater. Turtle thought, oh, I don't know if I could do that. I better change it again. So he changed it to a race. Changed it to a race. Beaver said, no problem. I'm the fastest swimmer around. So Turtle, who has to get along by being very clever and figuring out how to, to outsmart, said, you know, I'm going to start behind you because I think I'm so fast that you would probably need a head start. So he started behind. Well, Beaver took off swimming as fast as he could, and Turtle's back there and thinking, Phew, that Beaver is really going fast. So he reached out his neck and he grabbed a hold of the Beaver's tail. Well, the Beaver felt something, but he had to hurry. He was racing. He didn't want to stop and look what was back there. So Turtle was being pulled and pulled, and finally they were getting close to the other side. And Turtle bit down as hard as he could, and that hurt. So Beaver threw his tail up over his head, and just at the top, Turtle let go and landed right on the shore. And when the Beaver looked up, Turtle had won the race. <laughs> Turtle said, you have to leave, so the Beaver left the pond. And now Turtle had a very nice expanded pond. And I'm telling that story too, but I don't know if that's what really happened. <laughs> But, but what this points out, and, and the way that the Native people use these stories, nobody has to leave a pond. There's no fighting. This isn't a literal thing, but the interrelationship between the creatures, the fact that the, the beaver does make a larger pond, it changes the environment. It makes more habitat for other living things that couldn't live in just the little creek or small pond. And then as time goes on in that dam, erodes away and the, the water moves on. There's so many parts to the natural world, not just the creatures we think of, the beaver and the turtle and the deer who come to eat there and the birds who are in the trees, but the, the uh, decomposition of the leaves and the dying animals along the edges and, and uh, all of that goes down into the natural world and finds its place. So the stories the natives told were often often had the underlying message that we're all connected. We are all connected. Glacier Park is the last wildest place in America. It's the home of mountain sheep and mountain goats, black and grizzly bears, mountain lions, deer and antelope, and old game trails that follow along into meadows with thousands of flowers, larkspur, June roses, true forget-me-nots, and blazing sun next to fields of snow. It's all there in Glacier Park. Now, um, there were 300 miles to be covered by this, this journey. There uh, were 42 people. So imagine 42 people on 42 horses and then all the pack animals. This was a pretty big entourage going through the park. And they went over six mountain passes. And let me set you straight as to what a mountain pass really is. It's not a valley between two mountain peaks, as I had supposed. 
A mountain pass is a blood-curdling spot of which you, or horse, climbs like a goat, and on the other side of which, as you lead it, he slides down, often trampling on the tender part of your foot. A mountain pass is the highest spot between two peaks. You ascend it with chills, and you descend it with prayers. It's the sort of place that you want to forget about at the time and brag about when you get home. She wrote, about, uh, she wrote about the park conditions at the time. There were 13 rangers for the entire park, and that wasn't very many to take care of that, that big expanse of land, especially when there were people showing up with these newfangled motor cars and coaches breaking down in all sorts of odd places, and they had to be rescued. And she talks about how they would ride all day and exert themselves and just sit by the campfire at night drawing a deep breath and listening to the stories of Charlie Russell. Charlie and Nancy Russell were on that journey in 1915. She said it would be a travesty to repeat any of his stories here, because no one can tell a story like Charlie Russell. She was writing for, for us. This is what the Park Service had hoped would happen. That, that People would, would want to get out into the natural world and see it and experience it, and that's what the national parks were set up for. It hasn't been that many centuries that we've been so distant from our natural heritage. We're part of the natural world. We've been so for a long time. And us today, as we look at, at the encroachments of, of, of the 21st century life that we've surrounded ourselves with, getting back to nature and, and just taking a deep breath. Well, as she put it, the lure of high places gets in your blood. The call is a real call. Throw off the impediments of civilization, the telephones, the silly conversations, the lies that pass for truth. Go west and ride. Ride slowly, not to disturb the wild thing. Nerves that have tightened for years will loosen. Throw out your chest and take a deep breath and look across green valleys to mountain peaks where mountain goats stand on the edge of space. Let the summer rains fall on your upturned face and wash away the memory of all that is false or petty or cruel. Then the mountains will get you. You will go back. The, the call is a real call. I've traveled quite a bit. I've seen the Alps, cities call. There's no, uh, there's no lure for me. Perhaps it is because these great mountains are my mountains in my country. There's no voice as insistent as the wordless call of the Rocky Mountains. I'll go back. Those who go once always hope to go back. The lure of high places gets in their blood. Thank you.